Hello and welcome to the Golden State Motorsports Park. I'm Dan Mullen and welcome to the TM Master Cup Series Season Preview for 2019. This is the final day of preseason testing and a lot has happened in the offseason. Here we're going to be profiling the 18 teams contesting the 25 races that make up this year's TM Master Cup Series. I'm going to provide some analysis on their prospects based on how well they did last year and how well they've been doing in testing. These are only series regulars, no independence trophy cars. Without further ado, let's begin. First, let's take a look at Richter Motorsports, the team we have referred to as Gessler in the past because this was the Gessler factory team. For the past five years, this team has had Finland's Arto Kakinen and Minnesota's Kevin Dwyer as the two regular season drivers. Kakinen will return, taking the champions number one as he claimed the drivers championship in 2018. Kevin Dwyer, however, will not be back as a full-time driver. Dwyer is becoming a barnstorming driver, taking part in most of the big-name motorsport events across the world. He'll be running at Le Mans, Indy, Bathurst, and a few select Master Cup Series races this season. We wish him the best of luck in his endeavors. Replacing Dwyer in the full-time role is Mexican rookie Marco Diaz Castaneda. The 20-year-old was last year's TM Lights runner-up, and he performed admirably in his TM Master Cup Series debut in front of his home crowd. Honestly, the things to watch for on this team are not going to be nearly as complicated as they will be with other teams. We'll have to see how well Arto Kekkonen and his new teammate Marco Diaz Castaneda work together over the course of a season. Kekkonen's also the reigning champion, but Castaneda has actually been slightly faster than him in most of the test sessions. We're going to see if that carries over into the season, and we'll have to see how well Kekkonen responds to that. Also, we don't know what's going on with Kevin Dwyer, for the future. We know what's going on with Dwyer this year. Beyond this year, who knows? And I think that'll be more of an issue later in the season as to whether or not Dwyer comes back into the team, and if he does, who does he replace? With that being said, Carl Richter's team has never really had a lot of internal drama throughout its entire existence in the series, and that's a good thing. Richter knows how to keep a team organized and focused, so expect them to be contenders for the Drivers' Championship and Teams' Championship this season. Team EFR is an organization known for its loyalty and continuity, and that remains true going into this season, even though it might not appear so at first. Their both drivers have new car numbers. They've gone to Volpe cars after running their own for the past few seasons. But when Volpe entered the TM Master Cup Series, Team EFR was their first customer team. And they have once again gone back to customer Volpe's once the option became available. Yes, Cooper and Bates are running two new car numbers, but that's just window dressing. And this team has been good for at least a win or two a year, and I'd expect that to be true again also. Expect them to also fly under the radar quite a bit, as Scott Bates did when he won the championship in 2015. Bates' champions provisional will help him a lot at some of the special events, but if you've seen their qualifying record in special event races, I don't think he's going to need it all that much. The major storylines to watch for Team EFR are going to mostly involve how well both drivers perform in relationship to each other. Historically, Bates has usually blown Cooper out by quite a large margin. However, some of the wins that the Chicagoan has been able to steal have really made a big impact in the champions race. Not because they were able to win it, but because other drivers who needed the points more didn't. And I would watch for that particularly late in the season because they seem to really be good at stealing results that other drivers need more than they do. The offseason changes to the Volpe Racing Team don't appear to be massive, but upon closer inspection, they're much bigger than you think. Alessandro Rossini is coming off of two painful misses at the Drivers' Championship, and he returns to the white and orange Aperture Science car number three. The changes start to become more apparent when you look at the other side of the Volpe Garage. Leonid Roderick, who won his 5th and 6th championships here in 2016 and 2017, is taking a temporary sabbatical from driving. Tom Moore will be taking over the controls of car number 4, and that car will be blue and black as to oppose as Roderick's usual orange and black colors on this car. Moore has spent his Master Cup career in underperforming machinery so far, and Leonid Roderick has a great deal of confidence in him. I mentioned Leonid Roderick just there. He is going to be a part of this team, just not behind the wheel of the car. He will be calling the strategy for this team, and you can expect to hear a lot from him because he will be at most races. The most obvious point of interest at Volpe is what's changed and what hasn't, and how many changes there have been throughout the organization. The number three team has hardly changed at all. That's a known quantity and it's a known ticket to success, but just never enough to win the championship. The number four car is fundamentally different.
new driver, new crew chief. Roderick is calling race strategy instead of driving, and there are so many ways that that could go horribly wrong for this team over the course of the season. We've also never seen Tom Moore in a good car before. We know he has the talent, but can he perform in such a high-pressure environment? The third drivers for this team are also where things get interesting. We don't know if Leonid Roderick will be this team's third driver at Cariola to try to win his fourth Cariola Grand Prix. If he does that, what kind of focus will that draw away from the other main cars? Longtime R&D driver Rachel Rainsford returns this year after spending most of last year on maternity leave. Volpe's also been known to pull in some rather odd options for a third driver at times. Keep an eye on what happens with car number 40 throughout the course of the season as well. Overall, I think they have the potential to contend for the championship, but there's also a chance that this could completely implode very quickly and very badly. If there's any team that desperately needed changes coming into this season, it was Lennart International. Last year, this team was a complete circus. Infighting, drama, fights with other drivers. This team had it all, and it cost them a championship, which they were heavily favored to win. Savaral scored one win, it was very early in the season, but that was his only podium of the entire season. Despite all of the chaos this team endured last season, one of the few bright spots was Cameron Taylor's performances. This season, Taylor returns to take the wheel of the Schaefer Group car number 7. He's yet to score his first TM Master Cup Series win, but he's come awfully close on a couple of occasions. Given that Luciano Savarol made several unnecessary enemies last season, it's no surprise that he won't be a part of Lennart International's driving lineup for this season. His replacement will be last year's TM Lights champion, Saul Fischl. Fischl will be the first 18-year-old to compete in a TM Master Cup Series race in quite some time. Now, Fischl was actually too young to even compete in the first three TM Lights races last year. Then he goes on one of the biggest hot streaks anyone has ever seen, winning nine races and locked up the championship before the last race even started, even though he missed the first three. Fischl will turn 19 in April of this coming year, so he is definitely one of the hottest prospects to come into the series in a very long time. With that being said, the biggest story in Lennart International is whether or not Cameron Taylor is the right man to lead this team after such a disastrous season the year before. Personally, I think he can do it, but this year is where we're going to find out. He's yet to win a race, and so is his new teammate. In fact, both Taylor and Fischl are probably capable of winning early on. Speaking of Fischl, he's probably the next biggest story in that team. Fischl is essentially being handed one of the fastest cars in the field as a rookie, and in testing he has definitely shown that he can handle it, and handle the pressure. Now he's already claimed that he can win the championship as a rookie, and that he's already one of the best drivers in the world despite having never even started a race yet. That's a really bold prediction, especially since a rookie has never won the Master Cup before. There are a lot of people that believe Fischl can do that, I'm only going to say that I think it's possible. I think you're going to have to keep an eye on this team because this is one of the strongest contenders for the Master Cup so far, and they have been incredibly fast in testing. The first SAR team we're going to have a look at is Black Diamond Racing. If you told me last year before the European Tour that Luciano Savarol would be driving here in 2019, I would ask you how much you've been drinking because of that ugly incident in Carbondale between Savarol and Black Diamond Racing team owner Mike Rossiter. However, they appear to have patched things up and Savarol will be heading the charge for them in the Atlantis car number 5. With a sponsor that's new to the series, a driver new to this team who's just coming off of an ugly season last year, there's a lot of pressure to perform well early on here. Thankfully, the other side of the garage is much more stable, with Zelda Ashby returning to car number 55 with the same sponsor and much the same crew as last year. However, that last sentence leads us into the major problem with Black Diamond Racing in the past. They've been fast, they've won races before, but they've never really contended for a championship, even though both drivers they currently have driving for them have done so in the past. Ashby on one occasion, Savarol multiple times. However, in the past, they've not had as much manufacturer support that they do now. There is no SAR factory team, which means Black Diamond is effectively leading the charge. If you look at on-track results from years gone by, they've been doing that anyway. But what they haven't had is this amount of manufacturer support. If they are to have a major step up, this could be why. Manufacturer support never hurts. What can hurt a team running for the championship, however, are volatile, unpredictable personalities. Unfortunately for Black Diamond Racing, they're not exactly short on those. Luciano Savarol in particular. Not only that, Mike Rossiter, the team owner, has had his share of confrontations as well with other drivers, other team owners, me, the list goes on. If cooler heads can prevail, however, they'll do fine, and they have done fine in the past. 
Power Steering Incorporated has always been a very competitive team. While the factory Lennard team seemingly couldn't get out of their own way, Power Steering Incorporated had something of a breakout year. Both of their drivers got into victory lane twice, and both were in contention for the championship until late in the season. This despite the fact that they haven't really been running Lennards, they've been running the Lycoyas, which are slightly different but based off the same platform as the Lennard is. Once again, Kurt Pliskin will lead the charge in car number 16. This car is going to have a multitude of different paint jobs over the season, so don't get used to any of them. Just remember Kurt Pliskin in car number 16. That's a number and driver combo that stayed the same for a decade. Greg Woodard, similar story. There's probably going to be several paint jobs for car number 41. Woodard has always been very fast and very dependable ever since he debuted on the circuit, and that's probably why Lycoya Motors really likes him as much as they do. So funding is not really going to be an issue on the 41 side of the garage. However, the funding for the 16 car is a little inconsistent, and it always kinda has been. Which is a good segue to our first major talking point. While PSI has never been an underfunded team, they've never had consistent funding for those cars every year. Which admittedly is a bit of a red flag. That form of sponsorship kinda went the way of the dodo after the mid-2000s. I don't think you're gonna see as many special paint jobs throughout the grid. PSI is gonna be the outlier here. Another thing to consider is that 2018 was an absolutely massive year for this team. If they're going to match what they accomplished last year, it's going to require even greater heroics, because so many of the other teams on the grid have stepped up their programs. They're going to be under a lot of pressure to perform early on in order to prove that last year wasn't a fluke. Unfortunately for them, they haven't looked very good in testing so far. But I remember them looking even worse in testing last year, so this might not actually be a problem for them. Last year it seemed like they were sandbagging throughout testing, didn't perform that well in the first couple of races, and then Woodard goes out and wins Carbondale. So it turned out alright for them throughout the course of the season. Also have a look at their third driver, Woody Watts. That's one of the biggest comeback stories in motorsports in this decade. What do promoters really like? Good comeback stories that sell tickets. I have a feeling for that reason alone, Woody Watts will be getting a ton of promoters options throughout the course of the season. And what can PSI do with an extra car on the grid? They have the opportunity to get a lot of extra data that they can use to make the entire team faster that much quicker. One of the most highly anticipated new teams on the grid is Matthews Motorsports, based out of New England. This team's driver lineup almost feels like a bit of a throwback in some ways. Ryan Matthews is an owner-driver, he's in his 40s, but he's also got a good business sense that some of the owner drivers in the 90s and 2000s just didn't have. One look at his resume and the Independence Trophy and in FARC really should tell you that he is a very qualified race driver. He's done incredibly well in special events over the past few years as well. Alongside him will be Ben Atkins. The English driver has spent a few years bouncing around different teams. He started his career at Tutino, spent a couple years at the old Manicor engineering team. But this could be a big break for the former Dash Cup champion. Atkins has shown a decent amount of pace that wasn't expected of this team in testing. And it wasn't single lap pace either, it was on long runs. So that's a good sign going forwards. This is ostensibly an R&D season for Matthews Motorsports. They've never competed full-time at this level before. The car has never competed full-time at this level before. And both drivers have never quite tasted success, but both are capable of doing it. The measuring stick is not really going to be about can they win now, it's about can they set themselves up to build a juggernaut for the future. Maybe they can exceed their own expectations down the line. I think it's a bit unreasonable to suggest that they'll have a really good run at the championship, but that's not really the goal for this team this year. The goal is for them to just improve, because there really aren't that many expectations, because there really are so many question marks around them. Perhaps the only question they don't have to answer is financial stability. They're going to be in pretty good shape going forwards, and that's much more important than you think it is. At face value, it may appear that Hot as Walter Racing is a totally different team than it has been for the past five years, but nothing could be further from the truth. While yes, they do have an all-new driving lineup, most of the other key personnel on the team are still there. After a few near misses at winning a fourth Master Cup with the team, Adrian Devereaux took his services elsewhere. Likewise, Melanie Klavina left the team after not being able to recapture her 2014 form. Taking over the flagship number 13 car is Californian David Perkorian, who has served as the team's third driver even when he was running for other teams full-time. Despite only running on a part-time basis with the team, Perkorian has already scored a couple of victories. He now sets his sights on winning his first Master Cup. 
With Melanie Klavano's departure, this made the second Hodder's Walter car the most desired car during the offseason. There were more rumors than I could count for who would drive the second Hodder's Walter car, but at the end of January, Hodder's Walter announced Joe Olenek as the driver of the newly minted car number 23. For the past five years, olenek has been driving for the ill-fated Saar factory team. Now he finds himself in a quality ride with a real chance of not only winning his first race, but contending for his first Master Cup as well. Driving lineup aside, not much has changed over at Hot as Walter Racing. They still have that elite engineering staff that they've had for the past six or seven years that's gotten them several championships and more wins than any other team on the circuit. No pressure for the drivers, right? There are expectations for both Krikorian and Olenek to be contending for wins almost immediately, and those expectations might be far more reasonable than their resumes might make you think. While it's pretty obvious that both DK and Olenek deserve this chance, we don't know how they're both going to work together as a team yet, and that could create some issues down the line if it goes south. It kind of goes without saying that anyone that's been paying even the slightest bit of attention should know that Hot is Walter Racing is going to be a contender for the championship. Krikorian and Olenek aren't huge stars yet, I would expect that to change fairly quickly. Both these guys are incredibly fast, the team is somewhat of a well-oiled machine, and the Colton Morel Mizar appears to be a very strong car right out of the gate, so definitely keep an eye on cars 13 and 23. Oh yeah, and their third driver this year is Scott Stoidler, an old hand who is still capable of winning races whenever that car is entered, so watch out whenever Stoidler and car 26 are on the entry list. Last year couldn't end soon enough for Ortega Motorsports. Their on-track results fell off towards the end of last year, and team drivers Hector Serrano and Jose Luis Martinez had been feuding all season long. At season's end, Martinez walked away from the team, with Serrano returning in the number 20 KLTV ride. After winning a pair of TM Lights championships, Serrano has yet to taste that same glory at the Master Cup level. He's gotten a couple of pole positions and has been on the podium twice, but that first win still eludes him. It wasn't just Jose Luis Martinez that Hector Serrano had been feuding with last year. It was also some of the drivers in the DeGarmo Enterprises team. I'm mentioning that right now because Serrano's new teammate also has a fairly healthy dislike for DeGarmo Enterprises. Brandon LaRoe has gotten a second call up to drive in the TM Master Cup Series in car number 25. While both these cars are sponsored by KLTV, they are fairly distinct from each other, as the 25 car you see is blue and teal instead of black and teal. While it seems that Owen DeGarmo lives rent-free in the heads of everyone at Ortega Motorsport, that's a pretty mutual feeling between both teams, and nothing emphasizes that more than the pit lane brawl in Chicago last year. It goes without saying that Ortega Motorsports is probably most focused on beating DeGarmo Enterprises. That kind of motivation can really help spur a team to new heights. However, as we've seen multiple times between those two squads, it can also motivate them to do some pretty stupid things along the way. The mutual dislike of their archenemy by both Serrano and LaRoe could motivate them also. Keep in mind also that Brandon LaRoe is looking to beat Hector Serrano in a team built around Hector Serrano. So there's a good chance another intra-team rivalry could flare up again. And we could have yet another intra-team circus at Ortega Motorsport. This team actually looks a lot better in testing than they did last year. While they're certainly not front runners, they're probably going to be solid midfielders throughout the course of the season. Nothing could erase how bad last year was for this team than not only beating DeGarmo Enterprises, but from stealing a couple of top fives as well. That's about where this team is at right now. Oh, and um, avoiding any unnecessary drama certainly helps. There's that. DeGarmo Enterprises has usually been a farm team for Lennard drivers in the series. One of the new Lycoya factory drivers is Zach Webster, who came up through the Fark Low Dollar series and also won a consolation race at Decatur a few years ago. Webster will take the wheel of this red and yellow car number 87. The man who was expected to drive this car number 81 was Saul Fischel after Fischel dominated the TM Light Series, driving of course for Owen DeGarmo's team. However, when Fischel announced he was driving for Lennart International, DeGarmo had to scramble in order to find a driver for this car. Upwards of seven different drivers tested this car number 81, but eventually he gave the ride to Craig Janser who has been driving for his TM Lights team on and off for the past five years. While Craig Yancer has run at the TM Master Cup Series level before, he didn't exactly last very long, and I don't think too many people are going to remember him. While some people think Yancer's experience is why DeGarmo hired him, I'm honestly not entirely sure that's it, because Yancer has not had too many runs in TM Master Cup Series cars over the years. One of the more credible rumors going around is that DeGarmo wanted a driver who was a little bit heavy on money. And we believe Craig Yancer fit the bill. And wrote the bills. Glad someone believes in him enough to give him a second chance at least. 
If you're Zach Webster, then the number one focus is going to be beating Craig Yonser no matter what. If Yonser matches you, that doesn't look good. Some of the tactics and managerial decisions by this team have been incredibly questionable in the past. This team has often employed some rather, uh, creative, shall we say, tactics in order to make sure that both cars qualify for special events, for instance. They've also had a tendency to fire drivers mid-season with seemingly no warning. And while I already mentioned this earlier, this team has mostly focused on beating Ortega Motorsports seemingly than they are doing anything else. Much to the chagrin of race control. But it's made for great TV in the past. New Liberty Racing may be a new name to most fans, but this is not necessarily a new team. But after a miserable 2018 that saw this team miss two races for financial reasons, Ivan Katz have sold the team to 2007 Drivers' Champion and last year's Independence Trophy winner Tony Durbin. Durbin renamed the team New Liberty Racing, and he returns to the cockpit full-time to lead the team not only off the track, but on the track in this black car number 12. Durbin returns to the series after making a mockery of the ASCC last year as well. And I have to ask a two-pronged question. Is Tony Durbin ready to come back full-time? And is the rest of the field ready for him? When Tony Durbin bought out Cats of Engineering, there were still a lot of holdovers that he left on the payroll. One such example is driving alongside him as his teammate. Russian fan favorite Yevgeny Kuznetsov returns for his sixth season with the team. And despite new ownership, Kuznetsov's car will still carry number 15. Although he's still searching for his first career victory, New Liberty Racing could be his ticket to victory lane. However, if this team is going to crack into victory lane, it might not be right off the bat at the start of the season. Last year, when the customer car rule was lifted, Cats of Engineering ran Colton Morrell cars. They weren't particularly successful with them, and New Liberty Racing predictably has switched over to SARS. While this team is getting a lot of support not only from SAR, but from their fairly healthy sponsorship checks, they are the only team to be located in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And there haven't been many successful TM Master Cup Series teams to be based out of that area in quite some time. Most of the field is based in the Indianapolis area. There are a few teams in Illinois, a few teams in Ohio, and Black Diamond used to be in Pennsylvania. And while Matthews Motorsports is based in New England, that team is building everything in-house. New Liberty Racing is not. At least, not immediately. So they could be a little bit behind at first, but not for very long. The driving lineup here is pretty solid. Tony Durbin's a proven champion in multiple categories, and again, he did win the Independence Trophy last year with his own team. The third driver situation for this team is a little bit murky. They haven't announced anyone to drive the third car yet. However, these are the drivers we know have talked to the team about driving that car. Any one of them could have a run in that car, or potentially none of them, and it could be someone we haven't considered yet. And there's a healthy amount of veteranosity there, but also quite a few inexperienced guys as well. We'll have to wait and see what happens with that car. Either way, it's a third car, don't worry about it too much. While a run at the Drivers or Teams Championships might seem a little out of reach for these guys, don't be surprised if both of them are well inside the top 20 in the final point standings, or don't steal some big results towards the middle of the season, because there is far too much talent on this team for them to languish in the midfield for very long. Tony Durbin might be over 40 years old, and Yevgeny Kuznetsov might have been written off by most as nothing more than a pay driver. However, both of these guys are capable race drivers, and not only that, they seem to get along pretty well. That might seem a little odd knowing who Tony Durbin is. I think the cooperation between both drivers is going to help both of them immensely as the season progresses. The next two teams we're going to talk about are the result of multiple teams fielding an entry together. In other words, instead of it being one two-car team, these are two one-car teams sharing a full-time entry. The series is not altogether happy about this arrangement, but they're allowing it to proceed. Of the two, Lawrence Gravity Racing has significantly more cohesion than the other team in question. The Lawrence part of the team name comes from Frank Lawrence, and for the past five years this was known as the American Launch Energy Racing Team. When Launch Energy pulled its sponsorship back, this team went into somewhat of a death spiral. They had to scramble just to get one car ready to start the season. And here it is, car number 34 with German driver Lucas Grabert behind the wheel. It's a little hard to say whether or not Grabert is a bad driver choice or not. Because honestly, this is a rookie driver being thrown to the wolves. This is a team on the verge of collapse, and hiring a rookie seems like a bit of a mistake. 
Unfortunately, that does mean it's going to be very hard for us to judge his performances because we're not entirely sure what he's going to be capable of. The other half of the team, though, is thankfully a little more predictable. The gravity part of the team name refers to Gravity Racing, the very strong minor league team owned by Packer Carroll. And when Carroll left Volpe Racing Team, it appears that Carroll and Volpe hadn't entirely cut ties. And that's why Carroll is not only here with Lawrence Racing to form this team, but why they got a discount on old Volpe cars. So while this team is going to be running some old machinery, they're getting a very good deal on it, and that seems to be what was most important to Frank Lawrence. What we don't know is how independent the 34 and 71 cars are going to be. If they can find a decent amount of cohesion, this team might not be as bad as they appear to be on face value. There is a very high potential that Packer Carroll might absolutely blow Lucas Grabber out of the water, even though Grabber himself might not be doing that bad of a job behind the wheel of that car. So there could be very inconsistent performances across the team, but we have to remember that this is really two teams as one entry sharing the same cars. The cars themselves are year old Volpes, don't expect any world beating pace from them. Not to mention that reliability could be a big problem for this team because these are second hand cars and a couple of them were actually run last year as well. All of the third cars that this team is going to be run are probably not going to be from Lawrence's shop. They're probably all going to be extra gravity racing cars because they have the extra infrastructure to run them. As for what this team's goals are, for Packer Carroll it's to continue working with the 34 car and to try to form some kind of cohesion between the two entries. And for Lucas Grabert, this is probably going to be a very long rookie campaign. Best of luck, you're going to need it. Where do we start with Tenere Motorsports? While Lawrence Gravity Racing might be a two-car conglomerate, Tenere Motorsports is actually three teams merging together. I'm not entirely sure how this is going to work out, but we're going to find out. The only one of those three teams that looks remotely stable is Daniel Lechleiter and Lechleiter Motorsports with car number 10. This should be a pretty easy car to spot on track, and Lechleiter himself is a good driver and a good team manager. This third of the operation really shouldn't be much concern. However, I can't exactly say the same for everything else in the team. This orange 79 car is the old Clayson Enterprises team, and it's going to be driven by Clay Gibson for the first four races of the season. Beyond that, we're not entirely sure because this team is having some sponsor issues. And when I mean this team, I'm specifically referring to the 79. The 10 is well covered in sponsors. The third part of this triumvirate is not on track here today, and it's Team Thunder, and they're serving as mostly the R&D team for Tenere here. They haven't been in attendance in any of the preseason tests yet, and that's a little concerning as it is, but if the Clayson Enterprises car goes away, then it's likely that the Team Thunder car will pick up the slack. However, that's assuming they even know who's going to be driving that car. It's really odd for a factory back team, and you can put the word team in air quotes if you like, to be such a mess coming into the series, especially considering that Tenere was a powerhouse on the Independence Trophy for a while. The only third of the team that looks stable is the Lechleiter Motorsports car number 10. There are funding issues throughout the entire rest of the organization, and I don't know how long it'll be before some of those start affecting Daniel Lechleiter's team. This team is a factory outfit. They're only gonna be able to get support from themselves. The car hasn't looked particularly good in testing, and they look like they're already kind of spreading themselves too thin between the three cars. This could be a really long year for them, especially since nobody else in the field is running the Tenere car. If a team is already showing funding problems this early, that's also not a very good sign. And that could be what plagues this team very early and very often. And if the Clayson car withdraws early in the season, then the Team Thunder car is likely going to take over that spot. You may notice that notation on third drivers. This is everyone that we know of that has auditioned to drive the Team Thunder car or has tested with them privately during the offseason. That's a pretty long list of names, and I don't think half of them will be able to get a run in that car. The most likely driver to get a run is Daniel Sharp. Beyond that, well, Matt Taylor spent one weekend with the team at Road America, and then he promptly left and said he was never going to drive for them, but yet he's still reportedly in consideration for the drive. The main thing that Tenere Motorsports can hope for is that Daniel Lechleiter proves how good of a driver he really is. Because otherwise, this could be nothing but a baptism by fire. Before I get into much detail with Lynx Racing, 
I would like to point out that most of these note cards you're seeing here were drawn up about a week in advance. This is what we had drawn up for Lynx Racing. Now I would like you to forget most all of this. A lot has changed in a very short period of time for this team. After Ingrid Hadeland won Rookie of the Year with Hastert Racing, it was no surprise that she was going to be called up into the main Lynx Racing team sooner rather than later. When 39-year-old Yulia Nasova announced that she would not be competing in 2019 due to maternity leave, Hadeland's future became obvious. She would move over into Yulia Nasova's old ride and pair with Davina Henton to form a sort of master and apprentice relationship. Henton, the established star at Lynx Racing, looking forward to a bright 2019 season, and Hadeland, the young upstart who could learn off of Henton's wisdom and leadership skills. It wasn't just Henton's off-track leadership either. She was a strong leader on the track and in the garage as well. And she really worked hard to not only build up the number 11 team, but the entire organization as a whole. And just one look at Henton and Nasova's point totals from last season, and you see that both drivers scored most of their points in the back half of the season. And Nasova credited Henton for all of that success, even though there were no race victories to go along with that. And if you were to look at all the preseason tests before this week, it wouldn't be outlandish for you to say that Lynx Racing and Davina Henton were set up to make a legitimate run at the championship. Everything was going right for them. They were consistently fast with single run and long run pace, which is something they've struggled with in the past. They were fast on high speed tracks, they were fast on the road courses, and even their oval program looked like it was gradually improving. It really did look like this was the year where everything was going to go right for Lynx Racing and Davina Henton in particular where it looked like she was going to break out as a true superstar and bring this underdog team to new heights that seemed unattainable in the past. Davina Henton was involved in a highway accident just a few days ago. While we don't know all of the particulars of this incident, what we do know is that Henton was hospitalized after a collision with another vehicle. The driver of the other vehicle was not found. Lynx Racing did not announce a timetable for Henton to return to the TM Master Cup Series, and immediately speculation went around as to who would be brought up into car number 11. Quebecois driver Claire Aussier was announced as the interim driver for the 11 car, but an admittedly questionable outing by Aussier on the first day of testing here at Golden State Motorsports Park led Aussier to remove herself from the conversation of being Henton's relief driver. Alcier said she felt her place was to coach the younger drivers in the TM Lights program, as she has been doing since her disastrous Rookie of the Year attempt back in 2016. If Davina Henton was the anchor to Lynx Racing's TM Master Cup Series effort, then Claire Alcier has definitely been the anchor of the development team. And it's under Alcier's guidance that several drivers have come out of Lynx's development team, either into Lynx Racing proper, or have found roles with other teams and sometimes even in other categories. Claire Aussier was essentially being given the responsibility of choosing which one of Lynx's many development drivers was going to step in to take over their flagship car in the TM Master Cup Series on an interim basis. And Aussier's choice is incredibly baffling to say the least. 22-year-old Swede Liv Eklund has been given the role of being Davina Henton's relief driver for the time being. And I don't think I can stress exactly how far out of left field this comes from. Liv Eklund's best TM Lights finish is 11th, and she's only done that twice. To say that Eklund appeared out of her depth in the TM Lights series wouldn't entirely be incorrect, but it certainly seems like she has a lot more development to go before she's ready for any kind of role, much less this one. Lynx's decision to hire Eklund has caused a lot of controversy throughout the paddock. Leonid Roderick was highly critical of this move, saying that Liv Eklund had no business being in a Master Cup car for at least two more years. He expressed fears that Lynx Racing could effectively destroy her career before it began. Tony Durbin has insisted that they could have found a competent driver had Lynx Racing actually hired a male driver for a change. Lynx Racing, of course, has only hired one male driver in its entire existence, Chris Davenport, and he's signed to another team already going to cut this a bit short since we've already talked for a long time about Lynx Racing, but they have new national themed liveries for their two cars this season. Ingrid Hadeland, a sophomore driver in the TM Master Cup Series, but a first year driver in the main team proper, is going to be the team leader. There are so many ways that this could go wrong, especially in a team as fast as Lynx Racing supposedly is. Then we get to Liv Eklund, and Eklund has not looked very good in testing at all. Two years ago, Liv Eklund was running in electric cars, then she ran in TM Lights last year, didn't do all that well, but now here she is on the biggest stage possible. 
Eklund doesn't really have a plan B here. She doesn't have a TM Lights Ride lined up, although I suspect that once Henton comes back, Eklund will be moved back down into the TM Lights car. But we haven't been able to confirm that from Lynx Racing themselves. Also, it already appears that Liv Eklund and Ingrid Hadeland could be every stereotypical Scandinavian sports rivalry ever. And that is the absolute last thing that Lynx Racing needs. Eklund and Hadeland have already started to chirp at each other in the press and on social media. Oh, there are so many ways that this team could implode. I hope for their sake that Davina Henton isn't out that long, because at the rate this is going, this is going to be an absolute disaster. I wish I could say something hopeful here, but the only thing I can say is hold on tight. It's going to be a wild ride over there. Team Timothy makes a return to full-time competition for the first time in almost 15 years. The last time they competed full-time on the Master Cup circuit, Dan Timothy was both the owner and the driver. These days, however, he's just a team owner, and he's built a very competitive outfit in the lower categories. His drivers have won races and championships in TM Lights, and new for the season, he started up a Fark Low Dollar Series team. With all of that expansion in mind, it might be a bit of a surprise that he started a TM Master Cup Series team as well. And originally, this was only supposed to be an Independence Trophy outfit. However, when Maximus Racing looked to be in very shaky grounds and looked like they might not even make the beginning of the season, Team Timothy bought their entry in December, effectively trading their Independence Trophy entry for Maximus' full-time entry. That means that Team Timothy's famous number 68 will return to the grid on a full-time basis. Nebraskan corn magnet and longtime motorsport fan Dale Cottenham has put his money behind car number 68, resulting in this very colorful livery. New Jersey journeyman John Dilks will be the driver of this car, and he hopes to have a much more stable season than what he's had in the past. And that's not the only colorful livery over at Team Timothy. This green car here, car number 711, is going to be driven by Ike Durbin, finally giving him a chance to run full-time, an opportunity that is long overdue. And as much as Ike Durbin probably hates hearing this, I have to point out that there's no relationship between him and Tony Durbin, or between him and fake progressive slash scumbag Dick Durbin. Because Team Timothy didn't even know they were going to be competing full-time until December, you really should have modest expectations for this team at best. John Dilks has never had a stable drive before, and this is Ike Durbin's first time running full-time in the TM Master Cup Series. If this team stumbles out of the gate and has a really slow start to the season, I don't think anyone's going to be surprised. In fact, I don't think they're going to be surprised. However, what I think will be alarming is if they stay that bad throughout the course of the season. This team is probably going to start the year running year-old cars, and that has to be taken into consideration as well. Once they do show up with new machinery, however, it'll probably be a big improvement over what they're running right now. There are a lot of question marks and fairly low expectations for this team, so if both drivers total to about 100 points, then that'll be a good season for them. While that prediction does sound like I'm not giving this team a whole lot of credit, that's not necessarily the case, because Dan Timothy is the only man I could see getting a team like this onto the grid and having them still be a respectable outfit. The back of the grid can be a very unforgiving place. Best of luck, gentlemen. Ever since its inception in 2016, the Ohio-based Hastert Racing has been a good destination for rookie drivers. In the past, they've mostly been affiliated with teams running Gessler engines, which they have used also. This year, however, it's a different story. They moved over to SARS. This is the team that Ingrid Hadeland won Rookie of the Year for last year. This year, they're bringing up two more rookie drivers, the first of whom is Chuck Johnson out of the FARC series. Johnson might appear to be a bit old to be a rookie in the TM Master Cup series, but Hastert scouted him out for some time, and they brought him up to the series when he was ready. Yes, it could mean that Johnson doesn't stay around the series as long as someone else, but clearly, he's ready for the Master Cup Series and he deserves his chance. He'll take the wheel of the Calarsa car number 32. Behind the wheel of car number 33 will be another graduate of the Fark Low Dollar Series. Timothy Ruiz is a comparatively unheralded driver, but Hastert Racing scouted him out during his time in the Fark Series. They liked what they saw and they decided to give Ruiz a chance. Ruiz and Johnson look to be very evenly matched and they could surprise some people throughout the course of the season. In previous years, there's always been at least one driver at Hastert Racing that everyone had been talking about. Not so much this year. I think a lot of people are underestimating what Ruiz and Johnson are going to be able to do. And I definitely think they're motivated to shock the world. Another challenge that's worth noting is that Hastert is switching over to SAR cars. This comes after several years of becoming familiar with not only the Gessler motor, but the chassis last year as well. So that could be a big challenge for the team, particularly early in the season. 
It's highly unlikely that this team will have either of its cars in victory lane this year, or even on the podium. Their best result was a pair of eighths last year by Hadeland, and those were already considered great results at the time. I think what Hastert Racing is going to be looking for is for both its drivers to total up to about 150 to 170 points. They're probably going to spend most of their time in the lower midfield area. One final note, it's really not that often that you see a brown race car either, so props for a distinctive color scheme if nothing else. The oldest team competing in the TM Master Cup Series could not look any more different than it has in years past. Team Principal Thomas Mitchell is stepping down from the role he's held since 1956. The man taking his position is his grandson, Randall Mitchell. While that does make the name of this team a little bit of a misnomer, everything else involving this team will make you forget about that very quickly. Behind the wheel of this beautiful royal blue and silver car number 17 is Chris Davenport the Californian returning to the Michelin Suns for another season. Davenport had a couple of podiums towards the end of last year. It finally looks like Chris Davenport might have something to talk about off the racetrack about his own efforts on the track as opposed to his wife's efforts. His wife, of course, being Alexis Rainsford, the former two-time Master Cup Drivers' Champion who currently runs in the Champ Cars. But anytime you talk about the Michelin Suns, you have to talk about the legendary 74 car. What that car has meant not only for this team, for the series, and for motorsports in general. Three-time TM Master Cup Series Drivers Champion Adrian Devereaux approached Randall Mitchell to drive this car. Mitchell and Devereaux reportedly got through a contract in just two days. Throughout the past few years, Adrian Devereaux has become quite a student of history in this series. Devereaux noticed that the Mitchell and Son 74 car had never won the Drivers Championship. This appears to be his motivation for approaching Randall Mitchell to drive this car. As when he left Hodges Walter Racing, Devereaux said that he needed a new challenge to continue in the series at the same level he had in the past. If he's able to win a championship for this team, in this car, that could be absolutely massive. The reason I mentioned the change in leadership at this team is because I don't believe Thomas Mitchell would have been able to get this deal done with Adrian Devereaux. Randall Mitchell will be the first black team principal of a full-time team since 1989, and he's also going to be the youngest team principal on the grid at 36 years old. Adrian Devereaux is 35, and despite these two growing up an ocean away from each other, they have a very good mutual understanding of what they need to be successful this season. Davenport is going to be looking to have a very strong year as well, and in fact the pace is there for him to do that. The third driver for this team is also a little bit of an interesting story. Kareem Washington is a little bit young, but he looks like he could be one of the better drivers to come out of the South for quite some time. So that could be very interesting to keep an eye on in his few starts. Could this team win the Drivers' Championship this year? Maybe. We'll see. And finally, we come to the lovable losers of the TM Master Cup Series, Scuderia Tutino. I have to stress the lovable part of that because Scuderia Tutino is one of the most popular teams in the paddock. Not only for some of their workmanlike efforts with their own cars, but also in how much they help other teams in need, even when they really aren't in a position to do so themselves. Notice how I haven't said anything about how well they've done on track in the past five years. They've only scored one top ten, and that was in 2014 with Ben Atkins at the wheel. They haven't really had a driver lineup that looked as strong as 2014 until this year. Interestingly enough, going back to that particular race, the man driving Tutino's flagship car number 42 made his debut in that race for the same team. Irishman Gareth Hunt has made six starts over the past five seasons. No more than two a season, so he's still eligible for Rookie of the Year. While, like most drivers who end up driving here, Hunt is bringing some sponsorship, he's actually not been doing that badly in testing so far, for Tutino's standards at least. Yes, he's going to be running for Rookie of the Year against guys like Saul Fischl and Marco Castaneda but Gareth Hunt's efforts must be judged slightly differently than those. The other side of the Tutino garage, driving car number 50 is leather jacket aficionado Truman Ellison, one of the more colorful personalities to show up in the TM Master Cup Series grid in recent years. Ellison comes out of the FARC Low Dollar Series, and it really seemed like a surprise that he was able to score this Tutino ride, especially given some of his off-track interests, which include documentary filmmaking, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's a bit of an interesting character, with an interesting command of the English language. So if you're able to catch any interviews with him, you're in for a little bit of a treat. While it sounds like I'm underestimating his abilities as a driver by not mentioning them, 
He actually hasn't been going that badly in testing. In fact, his single lap pace appears to be quite formidable, so he could be in a position to steal some grid positions that Tutino doesn't normally find itself in a position to get. Given that Ellison comes out of short track racing, whereas Hunt comes out of rallying, that could give him a real leg up at some of the short track races, where qualifying tends to matter a lot more than people think it does. As much as it pains me to say this, anyone who's expecting Tutino to win the championship is probably out of their minds. No matter what the situation is, this is one of the most likable teams on the grid, but no matter what, they keep on fighting. As they've been doing the past couple of seasons, expect Tutino to be running year-old Volpe's for the entire season. Now that I think about it, Tutino might be one of the more effective driver development grounds on the entire circuit, so this could be a big springboard for both Gareth Hunt and Truman Ellison's careers if they're able to overachieve early in the season. Or at any point in the season, frankly. I said similar for other teams, but if both of them combine for 100 points, then they can call that a very good year. We'll find out how these predictions stack up when the series opens at Remembrance Field in San Antonio, Texas. If you'd like to watch some previous events in the series, check out this list over here. Or check out this video from a friend of the show.